Greetings everyone and welcome back to the bench. Today I have the guts out of a Radio Shack 40 watt power booster for car stereo. And well, where is its casing? Well, many years ago I took it apart to use it in a project. And many years after that, I recovered parts from that project and this ended up in my junk box and well, here it is. I want to hook it up to Quant Asylum Audio Analyzer and check the power output, distortion, and frequency response. The manual says it has pretty wonky frequency response, and I'm kind of curious of what's going on there. Now this particular model is the bottom one in the picture there for a whopping 20 bucks. You can see the catalog number, and that's the catalog number here on the unit. I have the owner's manual here. Here's the specifications. 20 watts per channel, 4 ohms, 40 total. So they're measuring this at 10%. I know Radio Shack didn't get into that deal where they, they said it was like 200 watts per channel, like some of the, the other brands. I remember there was a pyramid one with the built-in equalizer, and it claimed 200 watts per channel. And you hook it up and measure the power, and it was, you know, just the same as something like this. But look at the frequency response, 100 hertz to 10 kilohertz. It's really limited. And when I look at the uh, schematic diagram, I don't really see anything that's going to limit the frequency response that way. So that's why I want to hook it up. Another thing, I remember back in the day, I know I'm kind of showing my age, back in the 80s, you know, people used to say, oh, you take the power of the car stereo that it's connected to and add it to the power output of this for the total power. Well, that's not the way it works. As you can see, the incoming signal goes through a 10K resistor, and that's part of a divider. So what it's doing is bringing this back down near line level for the uh, amplifier to, you know, bring it back up to power output levels for the speakers. And of course, it's a bridged amplifier. Now a little bit of history of these power booster amp units you could buy. Well, back in the 70s, car stereos often didn't have a lot of output power. You know, realistically, you could get three to three and a half watts into four ohms before clipping as they used the simple push-pull type amplifier. Now, you could buy an outboard amplifier, but they were quite rare. But in the later 70s, these outboard amplifiers, which got a power booster moniker, they called them power boosters, came online and uh, got really popular in the 80s. Radio Shack's first power booster appeared in their 1978 catalog. And of course, as these progressed, you could get more features like equalizers and other controls, sound level meters, and things like that. Of course, in the 80s, they started making the car stereo head unit itself with bridged outputs for more power and it made these things redundant. Of course, in the late 80s, we started seeing the larger amplifiers with the built-in power supplies, and as the, we got into the 90s, these things got less and less popular. But this model hung on for quite a while. They gave it a facelift. They just changed the front cover of it, but it lasted until the 2001 catalog. And as far as Radio Shack goes, that was it for the power booster. As you can see here, the catalog number matches what's on the board here. So yeah, I bought this quite a while ago. If those are date codes on the chip, that's 1989. Pretty much the last week of 1989. And I don't remember when I bought it, but I know it was probably back around that time. So, yeah, it's been hacked up. The wires have been cut. I need to find the outputs and the inputs so I can get a signal into this thing and uh, get the signal back out. 
And I'll just do it to one side because, as you can see, it, it's just identical circuits for each bridge amp there. This is just a choke to help remove noise from the supply voltage. So I'll whip out the soldering iron and come back with the finished result. All right, I took my soldering iron and soldered the wires on. So we have the output, the power. These are the input. Don't know if it'll work. I'm quite capable of screwing things up. Okay, let's see what happens here. I got an aluminum plate. Aluminium. Power supply hooked up on the right side. Uh, set the current limit. Set it low. Always start low if you're not sure. So we're 12.6 volts. Well, I did hear the faintest click in the speaker. Drawing, uh, it's dropping. Maybe the cap's reforming. Oh. Oh, I can hear it. She's working. Let's hook up some music, see what it does. Okay. It is working. Seems to sound pretty good. So, well, let's get it on the Quant Asylum and see what it's all about. Okay, we're hooked up to the Quant Asylum using audiophile Wagos there. Of course, somebody in the comment section is going to ask me, where do you get those at? Never mind. Okay, to kick us off here, we're looking at distortion at 1 watt, 4 ohms. I'm only going to test this thing with 4 ohms because that's what you would normally use it at in an automotive environment. And look at this, it's not too bad. It's under 0.1. I was expecting worse, but hey, it's not too bad. What I'll do is I'll create some graphs of distortion versus power and distortion versus frequency. And I'll display those a little bit later. But I want to look at the frequency response. Now you can see here, it's not flat, but it's not bad at all, really, if you look at this point, which is... 20 hertz it's only 0.7 db down you know that's not really a big deal and at 20 kilohertz it's 1.3 so you know not audiophile but is that audible yeah, i don't think so i'm not sure where they're getting this number at this 100 hertz to 10,000 hertz i would say it's much better than that Sometimes companies do that with their cheaper things to drive you towards a more expensive device. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing any issues with frequency response with this device. It's pretty good. Here's the distortion versus frequency. Not too bad. And it's under 0.1%. Dips down as low as about 0.3 around 100 hertz at 1k it's still below around 2k just above 2k it goes above 0.1 and ends at about 0.3 percent at 20k and that's normal for these types of chips okay here's distortion versus output power I'm measuring this at 14.4, which what they usually do that with these chips, which is the higher end of a car with its engine running. And you can see, you start clipping around here, which would be around, uh, I don't know, 11 or 12 watts. And we're crossing close to 10% at around 20 watts, which, you know, that's what the thing's rated. 20 watts at 10% distortion into 4 ohms, so it's pretty much delivering exactly what you would expect. 
but I think 10% is a ridiculous number to use for distortion. For this type of device, 1% would be better. Of course, your watts won't be as, you know, as uh, attractive in that measurement. But the way these compress, and there's no markers really on this part of the graph, but it's around 15 watts or so. The actual clipping's starting to begin around here, 11 or 12 watts, which is exactly what I would expect for these things. Well, there you go. The Radio Shack 40 watt power booster, budgety $20 thing. I thought the distortion levels at normal listening levels around 2 watts weren't too bad at all. And the rest of the measurements were in line with, of what I would expect. So yeah, not too bad at all for this vintage device. At least the uh, what's left of it here, the circuit board. And that's it for this one. Thanks for watching.